Hello and welcome to today's lesson on Hooke's Law, which is part of the materials topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at how you measure the properties of elastic materials by considering Hooke's Law. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to recall Hooke's Law, calculate values using Hooke's Law, and know the different material properties related to Hooke's Law. So in this lesson, we're going to look at the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification 3.4.2.1 bulk properties of solids. Now resultant forces can cause an object to change shape, which is called material deformation. But there are three types of material deformation, and what are they? Well the first type of deformation is extension. This is when an object increases in size due to the deformant force being placed upon it. Now a force which causes an extension is called a tensile force or tension. So when tension is applied to an object, the extension has been is a positive change and the object has has increased in size. Now for this to take place, more than one force has to be applied on this particular object. Now the second type of deformation is compression. This is when an object decreases in size due to a force being placed upon it. Now in this lesson we're pretty much going to look at extension, however all cases also work for compression. Now a, co a force which causes a compression is called a compressive force. Now we define compression as a negative change. So when you have a compression applied to an object, object it decreases in size. Now once again for this to take place more than one force has to be applied to the object. Now the third type of deformation is bending. This is when an object doesn't change overall size but is distorted. So it can stay the same size but change shape. And once again for this to take place more than one force has to be applied onto the object. Now there are two ways an object can behave if a resultant force is placed upon it. It can behave with elastic behaviour or inelastic behaviour. Now an object is elastic if the object regains its original shape after the forces deforming it are removed. So when you have a deforming force removed from an elastic object, it will return to its original size and shape. Now an object is inelastic if the object does not return to its original shape when the forces deforming it are removed. So when the deforming force is removed on an inelastic object, the object will not return to its original shape, it will stay deformed. Now sometimes the term plastic can be used instead of inelastic but that can sometimes get confusing when you're considering plastic in the sense of a polymer. Now many objects have an elastic region and an inelastic region depending on the magnitude of the deformant force placed upon the object. So at lower deformant forces objects act as elastic while at higher forces object act as inelastic. So an object is elastic if the object regains its original shape after the deformant forces acting on it are removed. In object is inelastic if the object does not return to its original shape if the deforming forces acting on it are removed. Now many objects exhibit elastic behaviours at certain deforming forces and then exhibit inelastic behaviour at larger deforming forces. Now Robert Hooke was a scientist who examined elastic materials by placing a deforming force on them. So what happens to the extension of an object when you increase the force placed upon it and what conclusions could Hooke make from this? So Robert Hooke carried out the following. He examined elastic objects and play, by placing deforming force on them and then he realised the following three conclusions. That the more the deforming force that was placed on the material, the more they extended. That with some materials they extended in a directly proportional relationship. So if the deforming force was doubled, so was the extension and with a large enough deforming force the material snaps. So in this particular example, our deforming force is causing an extension. Now an extension is measured as the difference in length between the object with the deformant force and the length without the deforming force placed on the object. So extension is the change in the length of material which we'll define as delta L. Now we give the original length of the material the symbol L which is why we're allowed to have extension which is the length with the deformant force minus the length with no deformant force have the symbol of delta L, change in L. So extension is, me is measured as the difference in length between the object with a deformant force 
force and without a deforming force. So it was found that with a greater deforming force, there was a greater extension of the object, which is also true for compression if the force was acting in the opposite direction. And in fact, extension and deformant force increase at the same rate. They are in fact in direct proportion with each other, as one doubles the other doubles, which is Hooke's law. So when Hooke plotted this relationship of force against extension, he achieved a straight line trend in his graph. So an object is in the elastic phase when the graph of a force extension um, origin is a straight line. Now the straight line section shows that the force and extension are directly proportional to each other is so when the line of best fit is a straight line through the origin, it shows the two factors of the graph are in direct proportion to each other. So if the force extension graph of a material is a straight line, it obeys Hooke's law, the object is exhibiting elastic behaviour. Now just to clarify, the graph must go through the origin as when the force is zero, the extension has to be zero. If, if that isn't the case, you're not measuring extension, you're in fact measuring the length of the material. So Hooke realised, like, like we said before, that if a large enough deforming force was placed on the material, the force and extension are no longer acting in a directly proportional fashion. The point in which this occurs is called the limit of proportionality. It can also be sometimes referred to as the Hooke's law limit. Now he also realised Hook that if you place a large enough deforming force on the material the material stopped exhibiting elastic behaviour and started exhibiting inelastic behaviour. Now the point in which this occurs is called the elastic limit. Now the elastic limit is the point beyond which the material will become permanently stretched or you could say it is the point with which the material becomes permanently deformed. So when all of the force is removed beyond the elastic limit the material will be longer than it was at the start. Now for most objects the elastic limit and the limit of proportionality are not at the same deforming force. In a typical material the limit of proportionality occurs slightly before the elastic limit. So Hooke realised that after the elastic limit a material acts in the inelastic phase and eventually if enough material is placed, sorry, if the material has enough deforming force placed upon it the object will snap which is what we call the breaking point. Now in a force extension graph it's important to understand that the gradient of this graph is called the spring constant. So as a result a resulting forming force should cause extension so the line should go through the origin and if it doesn't it's like we said before because the experiment has not measured extension rather than measured length L. So we can work out what our spring constant is by taking the straight line gradient of this particular graph. Now we can define the spring constant as the amount of force needed to extend the object by one meter. It is how stiff an object is. The stiffer the object, the larger the spring constant. The stiffer the object, the more difficult it is for the object to extend. Now sometimes we can refer to the spring constant as the stiffness constant. Now it's important to note that the spring constant can only be taken in the straight line section of the graph when the material is in this elastic phase of behavior. This is because if the gradient is constant then the spring constant is a constant as the name suggests. Now the spring constant can only be measured when the material exhibits elastic behavior. Now just to clarify a point the spring constant is not the same as the spring modulus which is given the symbol lambda and is equal to the spring constant times by the length of the material. This is only considered in the A-level mathematics course and not the A-level physics course. Now we can use Hooke's law to define the spring constant and the deformant force. So Hooke's law states that the force needed to stretch a spring is directly proportional to the extension of the spring from its natural length up to the limit of proportionality. So in layman's terms, this means the greater the force applied to an elastic object, the greater the extension of the object. And this is observed in many experiments previously when the force on an ob or the force on a spring increases, the extension of that spring will therefore also increase. We can then lead this to the following equation, which is equal to for the deformant force is equal to the spring constant times by extension, where the deformant force is in newtons, the spring constant is in newtons per meter, and the extension is in meters. Now we can give these the symbols F is equal to K times by delta L, but this equation only applies up to the limit of proportionality. This equation is obeyed by wires and solid objects made out of most materials.
Okay, and this equation is used for both compression, where delta L is a negative because it's getting smaller, and extension, where delta L is a positive as it's getting larger. So we can derive quantities using Hooke's law as shown in the following example. A vertical steel spring is fixed at its upper end with an unstretched length of 300 millimeters. Its length is increased to 385 millimeters when a five Newton weight is attached to the lower end at rest. So let's calculate A, the spring constant, and B, the length of the spring when it supports an 8 newton weight at rest. So the first thing you've got to do to work out the spring constant is to work out the extension in meters. So you work out the extension by doing the length with the force minus the length without the force. So that's 385 millimeters minus 300 millimeters, which is 85 millimeters. You convert that into meters, so 0.085 meters, and then say spring constant is equal to the deformant force over the extension. So therefore it is 5.0 over 0.085, 59 newtons per meter. Now let's then work out the length of the spring when it supports an 8 newton weight at rest. Well, we know extension is equal to the deformant force over the spring constant, which is constant because it's an elastic object. So we do 8 over 59 newtons per meter. So it's 0.136 meters. That's our extension. So therefore, our overall length is going to therefore be the original length plus the extension. So it's 0.300 meters with 300 millimeters plus 0.136 meters so it equals 0.436 meters now we can calculate the spring constant of a material by measuring the extension of the material and the force exerted on the material as shown in the previous question however what would happen if we place springs in series or parallel with each other if we had multiple springs so if we place springs in series with each other this happens when the springs are attached one after the other which is very similar to the concept of series in electrical circuits one component follows the next one whilst one spring follows the next one whilst when springs are placed in parallel, the springs are attached side to side to each other, which is similar to the concept of parallel in electrical circuits. So we can calculate the overall spring constant when springs are placed in series. Now when springs are placed in series, the tension is in each spring is equal and the same to the weight that is exerted on this particular object. So we can say that the extension of the two springs is going to be equal to F over K, but we can obviously separate it out into spring 1 and spring 2, so therefore the total total extension, which is going to be the summation of both of them, is going to be F over K1 plus F over K2. So therefore, we can say it's going to be F over K. So F is a common term in this situation, so it can be cancelled out. So therefore, we can say 1 over K total is equal to 1 over K1 plus 1 over K2, which is actually the same mathematics as working out electrical resistance in parallel. Now, this equation shows us that the spring constant decreases when springs are placed in series. Now, so for example, if we said the spring constant of one spring was 30 newtons per meter and another spring was 20 newtons per meter, we can work out the total spring constant of the two when placed in series. So it's 1 over 30 plus 1 over 20, which we make our lowest, we make our, our common m multiple. We would say it's 2 over 60 plus 3 over 60. So therefore, 1 over kt is 5 over 60. So kt is 60 over 5, which is 12 newtons per meter. So this indicates to us that the total spring constant of the two springs is lower than the individual spring constants of each, which is why it's not common to see springs arranged in a series pattern in the real world. It decreases the overall spring constant. Now we can also calculate the overall spring constant when springs are placed in parallel. Now when a weight is supported by two springs in parallel with each other, the extension delta L of each spring is going to be the same, as it's the same length it's being pulled down by by the weight. So we can therefore say that the deformant force on the springs is k is equal to k1 times by delta L, where delta L will be the same value for each of them, so it's a common term. Now since the weight w is supported by both of the springs, we can say that the weight is equal to f1, deformant force 1, plus f2, deformant force 2. So we can therefore pop our equations in by saying k1 delta L plus k2 delta L. Now we can therefore say it's going to be k delta L. So if we then cancel out these delta 
else, we can say the total k is going to equal to k1 plus k2. So again, this is the same mathematics as working out the electrical resistance in series. So this shows us that when the springs are placed in parallel, the overall spring constant increases. Because if k1 is 30 newtons per meter and k2 is 20 newtons per meter, 30 plus 20 equals 50 newtons per meter. So the total spring constant of the two springs is the sum of the individuals. So this is why it's in fact common to see springs arranged in a parallel pattern in a real world as opposed to a series pattern. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should know what Hooke's law is, we should know what the elastic limit is, and we should know that F equals K delta L, where K is the stiffness and the spring constant. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to recall Hooke's law, calculate values using Hooke's law, and know the different material properties related to Hooke's law, which is part of the materials topic in AQA A-level physics. So I hope you've enjoyed this particular lesson on Hooke's law, and if you have any more questions, please do ask. But thank you very much, and have a lovely day.